Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Jenny Rosewood and I use uh, she, her pronouns. I'm a full-time technical writer on Google Workspace and I'm the communications chair uh, for Woo. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started and uh, start our union day. I am very excited to introduce our union day today. As some of you might have saw on Corp, our fellow union me member R.L. Corrin resigned from Google today after facing retaliation in the workplace. This union day is going to talk about ending Google complicity in Israeli apartheid. We will have a Q&A session section at the end, so we ask that you hold questions for that time. Um, but please stay to the end because we will share information about how you can take action and get more involved with the anti-militarism working group. I'm now going to hand things off to Liam to talk about the history of militarism at Google. Hi, so I'm Liam, and I'll be giving the first part of this presentation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the origin of Google's connections to militarism, military contracting, and intelligence contracting. So Google is a multinational corporation. It is an enormous, you know, many billion dollar corporation. So you're probably not surprised that it has a lot of connections to military and to state departments and to governments. But Google's connection specifically to the U.S. military, to the U.S. military intelligence apparatus, actually goes almost all the way back to its founding. A really key thing that happened pretty early on with Google's lifetime is that in 2003, Google acquired a startup called Keyhole, which is a CIA-funded and backed geospatial visualization technology, and it was a startup. And this eventually became Google Earth, but it, along with it came a lot of connections to the intelligence community and really began starting Google's uh, work trying to sell federal contracts and government contracts. This had a lot of connections to all of the intelligence agencies, as well as almost every single military and federal agency in the United States. Uh, it also included funding for projects like CrowdStrike, Jigsaw, Bellingcat, uh, funding and creating and hosting the CIA's Wikipedia clone called Intellipedia, and all of this. Most of the pushback in this era was not employee pushback, but it was mostly external, and it was centered around privacy and surveillance concerns. And I just want to plug, I think, actually, that Jenny can post a link. There's actually a book you can read about pretty much this whole first 10-year period called Surveillance Valley by Yash Levine, which I think goes into this really well. And so this sort of was the pattern for Google's relationship running from 2003 to roughly 2013 or 14. Let me go to the next slide. Now, I have to talk about Amazon. Uh, even though this is a, a union day, obviously, about Google, Alphabet, Israel, and the United States, uh, it's important to talk about what has happened with Amazon and Amazon Web Services specifically. In 2014, Amazon was able to break into offering cloud computing solutions to the United States government, specifically to the CIA. This was groundbreaking. This really changed the industry significantly to the point where they, they sort of disrupted uh, a, a market that was formerly dominated by big uh, companies like Microsoft and IBM. Suddenly, Amazon was a player in this, and it's actually opened it up for startups and smaller corporations and, uh, to get into this area and to do this work. And this is where Google got on board. Can we move to the next slide? Thanks. So this is a uh, timeline that we actually created for an Encorp website that sort of goes into more detail. And so there is an Encorp website that we'll link later that you can read all of these details. But what you should take away from this is from 2016 through now, there's been a massive ramp up in what Google is actually investing in and doing in terms of federal and military contracting, not only in specific contracts that they've been awarded, like the Maven contract in 2017, but also in specific technologies and functionalities that Google and Google Cloud have been sort of rated to do, which enables them to do more. And, and you know, this continues to this day. This timeline ends in April, but since then we've created Google Public Sector, which we'll talk about later. And we have the Nimbus contract, which has been awarded and or which is being uh, bid on. And so this is sort of in a continuing pattern. So highlights here are that the Department of Defense created the Defense Innovation Advisory Board, the DIA, and appointed former Google CEO Eric Schmidt to lead it. Google was awarded the Maven contract after meeting with General Mad Dog Mattis. Uh, after, of course, there was a massive amount of employee pushback in 2018, Google said they would not renew the Maven contract. But we think that this sort of is a dishonest response because we see that the very next year, Google applied to bid on the Customs and Border Patrol contract. They did the internal lockdowns. In 2020, Google pursued the Raven contract, which is with Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. 
in 2021, Google pursued both the Nimbus contract that we're talking about today and the joint work cloud and cloud capability contract, which is a massive multi-billion dollar contract to work with the Department of Defense. Uh, next slide, please. And now, you know, leading into what we're talking about today with Project Nimbus, the Nimbus contract is a contract to work with Israel, but you have to understand it in the context of what Google is doing. This is part of the overall vision for Google of getting into, into defense contracting. Um, Israel is considered by the US to be part of its national security interests and working with the government is how our company sees uh, its goals and what it should be working with. Thomas Kurian just this year in a public blog post defending work with the government said, we understand not every Googler will agree, but we believe Google Cloud should serve to see the government. This is a multinational corporation, but it was clear what government that he means when he says the government. And so, with that being the case, I'll actually hand it off now for our next section into Anirad, who's going to talk to us more about Project Nimbus specifically. Thanks, Liam. Um, so I'm Anirad. I'm a software engineer based out of Seattle. I'm going to use him pronouns. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what exactly is Project Nimbus? Um, according to Google's announcement, it is the digital transformation project for the government of Israel. Um, this was announced on the Google Cloud blog on May 25th of 2021. Um, so this announcement soon after uh, Israel started bombing Gaza in May 2021 is what started us organizing against Nimbus. That little logo down below with the Israeli flag is um, from training materials accessed by The Intercept. Next slide. All right. So well, we have a lot of government contracts, right? Um, we have some with the government of Venice, um, with the Manchester City Council. Um, so what makes the Israeli government contract so problematic? Um, so a common theme with Google's announcements of government contracts is that we highlight nicer applications, um, in the case of the blog post, like civilian stuff within Israel, while leaving controversial applications to trade magazines to cover. Um, so that first headline in the top left is from an article by Data Center Dynamics um, announcing Google's win of the Israeli Nimbus contract. And it quotes someone from the Israeli prime minister's office saying that we're, bu we're uh, building a cloud data center in Israel, and that's going to provide services to the Israeli government, the public sector, the IDF, and other bodies, the IDF being the Israeli Defense Forces, um, the Army of Israel. Uh, that second headline um, on the right is from an article by the Times of Israel, which quotes an official from the Israeli finance ministry saying that the contract language also bars the firms from denying services to particular government entities. And I think what they have in mind is um, denying services, particularly to the Israeli Ministry of Defense. That last headline um, which is from an article this year, May 1st, 2022, on ZDNet, um, is about Israeli's Ministry of Defense moving to the public cloud. So this is kind of explaining their entire Nimbus strategy. Next slide. All right, so um, we have us selling to the military of Israel. What is it that we're trying to sell them on? Um, so these training materials um, accessed by The Intercept have more than 20 slides in them outlining features of cloud AI. These are just two examples, one of them showing off object recognition, one of them showing off um, sentiment analysis. So we're selling the Israeli military AI. Um, does this follow the AI principles? Um, so I don't think any military usage of AI really can be considered to follow the AI principles. Um, with the Israeli military, I think there are two very, very obvious ways that it does not, that we can show with the, uh, by looking at the Israeli military's conduct uh, up to now. Next slide, please. Um, so can we, uh, so let's review the AI principles really quick. Um, at the bottom of the AI principles page, there are two, there's a, a big section about AI applications we will not pursue. Um, I'm going to focus on three and four, which are technologies that gather or use information for surveillance, violating internationally accepted norms. 
and technologies whose purpose contravenes widely acceptable principles of international law and human rights. Um, so I'm going to show how the Israeli military's current use of technology doesn't really, uh, isn't really compatible with either of these two things. So next slide, please. So surveillance. One thing that was revealed last year in a joint investigation by the Israeli human rights group Breaking the Silence and the Washington Post is the uh, Blue Wolf Surveillance Program, which was a program that the Israeli military engaged in in the West Bank. Um, what happened here is that the Israeli military developed a phone app and they would use facial recognition on random Palestinians on the streets and it would say, oh, you know, what do we do with this person? Do we, they have like a need to be arrested um, or should we leave them alone? In order to build this database, um, we had sol they had soldiers uh, compete in little friendly competitions to photograph as many Palestinians as possible. Um, it's estimated like thousands of people were caught up in this. Um, and this is having your photo taken under really dubious consent because the soldiers have guns and you do not. So hopefully that is a convincing argument that um, the Israeli government's current use of AI is not compatible with our statement about surveillance. Um, next slide, please. Let's look at human rights now. Uh, one of the bigger news stories of this year and last year is uh, Amnesty International and the United Nations and Human Rights Watch, among other organizations, declaring uh, the Israeli government's occupation of Palestine to constitute the international crime against humanity of apartheid. So what is apartheid? Next slide, please. We're probably most familiar with the manifestation of apartheid in South Africa, um, but it is a crime that does not necessarily have to be limited to that specific instance in South Africa. It's defined in two documents the 1973 Convention Against Apartheid and the 1998 Rome Statutes. Um, and there's, between those two, a three-part definition, which is that there exists an institutionalized regime of systemic racial oppression and discrimination established with the intent to maintain the domination of one racial group over another, and which features inhumane acts committed as an integral part of the regime. Um, and then somewhere else in the documents, they talk about uh, the inhumane acts. So some examples of these are murder, torture, imprisonment, deportation, or forcible population transfer. Um, you might be aware that uh, Israel has a habit of knocking down Palestinian homes in order for settlers to build new settlements on top of the ruins. Um, and then there's also a lot more concrete examples of what this apartheid regime looks like from this year alone. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what are the big news items of the Israeli occupation in 2022? Um, earlier this month, Israel bombed Gaza, killing dozens of Palestinians. In one incident, Israeli officials claimed a Palestinian militant rocket killed five children. And then two weeks later, admitted to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz that uh, the Israeli airstrike had actually killed its children. Two weeks ago, um, a little bit after these bombings, uh, the Israeli military raided seven human rights NGOs in Palestine, even welding some of their office doors shut. This is actually the second time they've done this in as many years. Um, that screenshot on the right is from Al Haq, which was one of the raided organizations. They are a Palestinian legal aid organization, and you can see a photo of their office door, which was welded shut. In May, Israeli soldiers shot and killed the journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. She worked for Al Jazeera. Um, and initially, the Israeli government accused Palestinian militants of shooting her in the crossfire. Um, many investigations later, um, it's been demonstrated that the Israeli military fired the bullet that killed her. Um, there were no Palestinian militants anywhere near her. Um, and then this is just the noteworthy news items in addition to the regular uh, parade of home demolitions, arrests, and nighttime raids, Israeli military occupation. Um, 
and also just today, uh, which I didn't have a chance to put into this slide, um, and something that's eerily reminiscent of Guantanamo Bay, an Israeli court sentenced the Gaza aid worker Mohammed El Halabi to 12 years in prison for supposedly funneling money to Hamas while he was working for World Vision, which is a Christian charity. Um, this was after a six-year trial based off of a classified confession, which was extracted from El Halabi after he had been detained by the Israeli Defense Forces without being able to see his lawyer for 50 days. All right, so we have um, the Israeli government receiving a cloud contract, or us giving the Israeli government and the Israeli military AI technology. Um, and we have the Israeli military operating in ways that are really, really just not compatible with the AI principles. So what have we done about this so far? So in May 2021, during Israel's bombing of Gaza, we put together the Drop Nimbus letter, which is an open letter that got, that got over uh, 700 signatures, and there was some outside reporting about this. Um, Ariel, a uh, AWU member who will speak uh, a little bit later, is part of the organizing around this letter and faced some retaliation by Google. Um, it moved her position to Brazil without any notice or discussion. Um, so we raised concerns about this to a U.S. representative of, from California, Anna Eshu, and she sent an email to Sundar uh, expressing her concern. Um, Palestine Legal, which is a legal aid organization, also wrote a letter to Google voicing concern about retaliation. Um, we've also had multiple discussion sections with coworkers on Corp, and we've had story questions in the weather report and TGIF and so on. So far, Google leadership has sidelined and ignored us. So. Um, what makes fighting this contract so hard? Um, Ariel is going to speak a little bit next about a common argument that is used to kind of defend the Israeli government's actions. Next slide. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Ariel. I use she, her pronouns. And um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, which we agreed was something that was important for us to touch upon because of the fact that many folks, and I'm sure folks who are in this call can relate to feeling like one of the biggest barriers to being able to speak out about Project Nimbus specifically and generally about Google's complicity and Israeli apartheid has been you know, the weaponization of anti-Semitism, the accusations, false narratives of, of anti-Semitism and accusing people who speak out of anti-Semitism. So we just want to kind of like talk together about establishing why anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are not the same thing and why speaking out is not anti-Semitic. So uh, we could go to the next slide. And by the way, um, some of this might be really redundant for a lot of the folks on this call, but we thought it would be helpful to provide some of these definitions so we can start with what is anti-Semitism. Um, one thing I do want to flag is the fact that, you know, within Google and across institutions, we see mostly from folks who are from the right wing and who engage in what, what is called like the weaponization of anti-Semitism, we see a lot of pressure to codify a definition of anti-Semitism. And so just like other forms of oppression, you know, folks who, many folks who have spent a lot of time kind of working on addressing the weaponizations of anti-Semitism have emphasized that just like other forms of bigotry, anti-Semitism is something that's evolving and it doesn't need to be codified. There doesn't need to be a definition. Um, what I will share is it's a little bit long, so forgive me because I didn't have the time to cut, cut down on it, but it's, it's a member of Jewish Voice for Peace um, who recently was speaking out on a panel specifically about why anti-Semitism is not the same thing as anti-Zionism. So she provided a little bit of context. So I'll, I'll read um, just verbatim from what she shared. And actually one of the, the Jewish Google workers who, who provided a testimony today quoted from, from some of the stuff that she shared. So I'll share this. Um, so the simple definition of anti-Semitism is that it is prejudice, discrimination, or violence against Jewish people. Jewish people are people who are who religiously are followers of Judaism, who belong to the Jewish religion, or people who have a Jewish cultural background or a Jewish ethno-religious background. Um, most people who are anti-Semites anti actually view Jews as a race, but this is an anti-Semitic viewpoint. Um, anti-Semitism has a very long history in Europe where it first developed. It is a European colonial white hegemonic invention 
It first was developed during feudal times in a closed system of landowners and serfs. Jews were prohibited from owning land, basically forcing them into the roles of craftsmen, merchants, or money lenders. That latter role became the basis for one of the most pernicious stereotypes about Jews, which is the stereotype of a rich and greedy Jew. When the peasants would rise up against the upper classes, they were falsely told that the real culprits of their terrible conditions were the Jews diverting their righteous anger away from the landowners who were oppressing them and resulting in Jews being the victims of violent pogroms, which are mobs that would physically attack Jews and destroy their homes. Jews were also viewed as responsible for the death of Christ, and they often lived in fear, especially around Christian holidays like Easter, because scripture would be read in churches blaming the Jews for Christ's death. And this is um, this would turn into to violent pogroms that would be sparked. And to this day, those passages are actually still read aloud in a lot of churches. A related stereotype was the blood li libel, the idea that Jews use the blood of Christian babies in their ceremonies. We see vestiges of, vestiges of this today when anti-Semitic organizations make obscure and inappropriate references to child sacrifice rings, something that we've seen QAnon do a lot as well. Another stereotype associated with Jews is that of the Jewish communist or socialist. This is due to the high level of Jewish involvement in workers' struggles. Um, which you know has continued, which originated in in Europe and in diaspora all across diaspora, and then continued in the United States and other countries where Jews migrated to. Um, so Jews could either be stereotyped as rich and controlling and greedy, or as part of the revolutionary forces of socialism, depending on the circumstance and the context. Jews are also characterized as not fully patriotic to the country they're living in, having quote unquote dual loyalties, which I think is something important to emphasize um, in the context of these false weaponizations of anti Semitism and the false conflations of anti Semitism and anti Zionism because of this dual loyalty trope. Um, this has particularly been brought up recently, not only historically, but recently, particularly in relation to Israel. So when former President Trump addressed the Republican Jewish coalition in 2019, he referred to Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the prime minister of Israel at the time as your prime minister, even though he was speaking to a group of Jewish people. In the present day United States, the main proponents of anti-Semitism are white supremacist organizations. QAnon claims that a secret cabal of Jews controlled the world and sexually abuse and traffic Christian children, specifically white Christian children for their blood. Um, there were a number of insurrectionists who were part of the January 6th insurrection who displayed anti-Semitic messages such as Camp Auschwitz and 6MWE, you might have seen on folks shirts, which meant 6 million wasn't enough. Interestingly, many of the folks who displayed Camp Auschwitz shirts and, um, and flags were also carrying Israeli flags. So they hate Jews but love Israel. Very interesting. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there were recent leaflet drops of hate literature espousing Holocaust denialism and blaming Jews for COVID-19. The Great Replacement Theory, which has been cited by a number of mass shooters in recent years, claims that a secret cabal of elites, namely Jews, are behind efforts to replace the white population of the United States with immigrants from other parts of the world who they can better control. The shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue was motivated by a desire to shoot Jews who were welcoming refugees. And a big part of why that synagogue was targeted was because it was serving as a sanctuary for refugees. The El Paso shooting of 2019, the Christchurch mosque shooting in New Zealand, the recent shooting targeting the black community in Buffalo were all related to the great replacement theory. The shooter um, in the latter shooting said that he was angry that his Jewish dentist had certainly conspired to cause him additional tooth pain. And that made him wanna lash out. And he actually said that. Um, so that, you know, that is some, just some context. And I think some of the important things that are emphasized there um, are the fact that anti-Semitism is part of the white nationalist machinery. And so isolating anti-Semitism from other forms of oppression is, it, it's a tactic that is intentional, it's divisive, but it, it, it is not rooted in reality and it's not effective. And we can go on to the next slide. So I want to talk about anti-Zionism. So anti-Zionism is the opposition to the idea of an ethno-state, a Jewish ethno-state in occupied historic Palestine. So that is what anti-Zionism means. 
It doesn't mean that there is a belief that Jews should not be safe in diaspora. It does not mean that there is a belief that any group should not be safe. It is, an, it is rooted in anti-nationalism and the idea that there should not ever be any existence of any ethno state. And I wanted to read um, an excerpt from the same JVP members uh, speech that she gave, because I think she articulated it really well. She actually described Zionism as a tool of the right wing. And I think that's it's important to share what she wrote. Um, it's important to note that you don't have to be Jewish to be Zionist. In fact, you don't have to like Jews to be Zionist. Two years after the Balfour Declaration was issued by the British government to support the creation of the Jewish homeland in Palestine, Lord Balfour declared that Zionism would mitigate the age-long miseries created for Western civilization by the presence in its midst of a body which too long has been alien and even hostile. So the original benefactor of Zionism thought of it as a way to rid his country of undesirable Jews. Among today's more prominent anti-Semitic Zionists is Pastor John Hagee who heads KUFI, the um, Christians United for Israel, which is actually the top funding and lobbying source for Israel in the US and globally. So the top funding and lob lobbying source um, for Israel and for Zionism is white Christian Zionism, not Jewish Zionism. Um, so KUFI, Christians United for Israel, is a major part of the white evangelical Christian Zionist movement led by this pastor, John Hagee, who once said that Hitler and the 6 million dead Jews were God's instrument to facilitate other Jews moving to Israel. KUFI believes that the migration of Jews to Israel is a necessary prerequisite for the second coming of Christ when Jews will either convert or go straight to hell. Kufi espouses similarly prejudiced views towards Muslims, towards Palestinians, and towards all people of color. It is a white supremacist organization. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's the largest Israel lobby in the US. It has 10 million members compared to the largest Jewish lobby group, APAC, which has 100,000 members. For those on the right, Zionism means supporting the policies of the state of Israel. Um, including the occupation and advocating for continued U.S. military aid. Israeli expansionist organizations are funded by a combination of the Israeli government and private U.S. foundations and individuals. The settlement division of the, the World Zionist Organization regularly funds illegal construction in the West Bank. The Jewish National Fund uses its tax-deductible donations to acquire Palestinian land, including about 16,000 acres of land in the West Bank for settlements. Um, the Falik family, F Falik family, the owners of the 180 duty-free America stores found in airports, has donated at least $5.6 million to settler groups in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem over the past decade, leading to what many have probably heard of um, a boycott of duty-free America stores. So that is hopefully a little bit of helpful comments. And please just plug anything into the chat if there are any thoughts or, you know, questions, et cetera. Um, and we can also go on to the next slide. So what is weaponizing anti-Semitism? What does that mean? Weaponizing anti-Semitism is accusing people, others of anti-Semitism, specifically because of their anti-Israel views or because they're seeking to express solidarity with the Palestinian cause um, and to hold Israel accountable for its actions. So weaponizing anti-Semitism has become extremely routine around the world, across different institutions. You know, Google is somewhere where we, we're really seeing it play out, but it's no exception by any means. Um, and I think one of the most important ways to respond to weaponizations of anti-Semitism is awareness. And that's part of why we wanted to include this piece of the conversation um, in our union day so that we can kind of just have some shared vocabulary and be able to really understand. And I think understanding, you know, what anti-Semitism anti is and the fact that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism and, and being able to actually articulate that is one of the most powerful tools um, for being able to create a culture where we can kind of denormalize this really widespread weaponization. And I'd be curious to hear from folks in this call if you've um, experienced this during your time at Google, because I know today, you know, we shared, we shared a series of 15 different worker stories and every single person had experienced this, you know, kind of the compounding um, threats and intimidation inherent in these weaponizations of diversity of DEI 
And in this case, particularly, it takes the form of weaponizations of, of false narratives of anti-Semitism to justify a culture of repression and censorship and silencing. And so I know that this is something that, that many have experienced. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, we want to particularly highlight today the fact that the people who have been the most directly impacted by these weaponizations of anti-Semitism have been our Palestinian co-workers. And since we launched our campaign to drop Nimbus, some folks might have noticed that there have been, you know, I think close to a thousand Google workers have now signed our petition and there have been dozens and dozens of Google workers who have came who have come forward. Um, but you know, Gabriel Schubiner, who many probably know, and myself, uh, have been the only workers who have spoke, spoken out publicly so far. And a big part of why that is, is because we as Jewish workers have felt this deep sense of responsibility and privilege, really, to, to feel relatively safe speaking out. And our Palestinian co-workers have not been afforded that safety. Um, we can go, well, actually, let me just share these links really quickly. Um, they have not been afforded that safety. And I think it's really, really important that we that we disrupt this systemic silencing that Google is engaging in, this silencing of, pal of our Palestinian co-workers' voices, and that we, you know, just demonstrate the awareness and, and the, the capacity for seeing through these weaponizations and really coming together as a coalition to not allow diversity to be weaponized against our Palestinian colleagues and other marginalized communities um, who whom were, you know, we're advocating for and also marginalized communities within our own workforce. Um, and so at that link, uh, bit.ly slash Google dash voices. Oh, thank you, Jenny, as well for dropping that in the chat. Um, you can take some time to actually look at 15 workers testimonies. Many of those workers are Palestinian workers and others are allies who are Arab Muslim black and anti-Zionist anti Jewish allies who are also Google workers who kind of share the experiences um, that the, and the things that they've witnessed at Google, particularly as it pertains to the way that Google is weaponizing its DEI system and weaponizing anti-Semitism in order, in order to really sustain this culture of silencing. Um, another link I put here is the link to our to Jewish Diaspora Solidarity. So Jewish Diaspora and Tech is, is a collective of originally started by um, anti-Zionist Jewish workers who wanted to actually be, you know, who wanted to create a space where we could organize without worrying about this censorship, because unfortunately, the mainstream kind of Jewish ERG is under the leadership of right-wing people who are engaging in this behavior of harassing people and weaponizing anti-Semitism in order to stifle Palestinian voices and, and anti-Zionist peoples and including anti-Zionist Jewish voices as well. So we created this coalition, Jewish Diaspora and Tech. The external website is jewishdiasporatech.org, but there's also an internal group that, you know, everyone here would be more than welcome to join. And we'd love to have more folks um, join that group on Corp. That's the link to join Jewish Diaspora Dash Solidarity. I see some folks who are in the call who are part of that group. So it's really good to see you here. Um, everyone is welcome. It is an explicitly anti-Zionist space and it's a space where, you know, we can convene and organize and be in community and, you know, express and act in solidarity with our Palestinian colleagues and with our Palestinian users and Palestinians around the world in Palestine and in the diaspora. And oh, and the last link there is go. Thank you to Jenny for making a go link for this and to Josh. Also shout out to Josh and Jenny for waking up today at 4.30 a.m. to make this go link and to help all of this get launched. But go slash Ariel dash farewell dash letter. You can read kind of like the full context on how this culture of weaponization of diversity has played out um, within the company and also read a lot of different workers perspectives and kind of like the full story as well, um, if you'd like to, to read and share that letter. And please, as I mentioned, um, you know, amplify the voices of our Palestinian coworkers, who once again, I just want to emphasize, have not been afforded the privilege to feel safe. And, and I just want to call it the fact that none of us who is speaking today identifies as Palestinian. And I think it's just really important, you know, that that we do everything we can to to interrupt this silencing that's occurring and to and to share their voices and to amplify them far and wide. So please do share all of these stories. And I think in closing, we wanted to actually show a video that um, that shares different pieces of different workers' stories as well. 
Palestinian and allied Google employees speak out about the anti-Palestinian bias they have witnessed within the company. This bias and the larger company pattern of stifling concerned workers' voices is part of a larger culture, the same culture that has enabled Google to justify its $1 billion contract with the Israeli government and military, Project Nimbus. Many of the Google employees in this video are speaking out anonymously due to fear of retaliation. To protect their identities, their stories are read aloud by volunteers. You can hear their full testimonies at bit.ly slash Google Voices. Google's Project Nimbus will be a big, ugly moment in Google's history and a shameful and embarrassing engagement. Project Nimbus will demoralize and agonize the many Googlers who truly believe and stand for Google's mission and values. Working at Google was always my dream job until I learned about Project Nimbus. I feel like I'm making my living off the oppression of my family back home. If Google truly believes in avoiding unjust impacts through the use of their AI, then why are they choosing to profit from a billion dollar contract with a government and military which consistently violates international law? Countless employees have tried to speak out about violations the Palestinians have endured and have been intentionally ignored. So when opaque military contracts arise like Project Nimbus, it makes me feel like I am working for the bad guy. It has become impossible to express any opinion of disagreement of the war waged on Palestinians without being called into an HR meeting with the threat of retaliation. As a Palestinian, my feelings of marginalization only grew when I began seeing my coworkers issued warnings just for having empathy for Palestinians. I shared an internal fundraiser in a Google-wide forum. I was told that the phrase support Palestine is offensive and anti-Semitic. I have found Google's DEI program to be a whitewash. It's more of a tool for censorship and control than for truly supporting employees. I am deeply disappointed by the company's response to the employee petition to drop Project Nimbus. Google has not responded to our voices and our many attempts to escalate our ethical concerns in a civil and respectful manner. When the violence in Gaza escalated in May of 2021, I started to notice just how discriminatory Google is against Palestinians. Project Nimbus makes me feel ashamed to work here. I just hope our company will stop ignoring its own workers and do the right thing. Learning about the Project Nimbus deal and seeing with my own eyes how leaders in the company completely neglected Palestinians made me really disappointed in this company. I know from what I have seen at Google that speaking freely with my name would have detrimental impact on my life by leading me to be retaliated against and even accused of anti-Semitism simply for defending Palestinian rights. During my time at Google, I had my opinions called anti-Semitic by the unelected people who purport to speak on behalf of all Jews at Google. I am Jewish, born and raised in Israel. The claims directed at me have no grounding in reason. They are knee-jerks reactions I've gotten because it's a reaction you get at Google for having non-Zionist views. It is clear Google doesn't care about anti-Semitism when it comes to truly protecting religious and ethnic minorities from the threats of the rise in white Christian nationalism. All they care about is using their own convenient and false definitions of anti-Semitism to set the stage for their profits off of business with Israel. Zionist employees at Google have called for myself and my fellow Jewish coworkers to be fired for speaking up about our concerns with Project Nimbus, accused us of being anti-Semitic and shameful to the Jewish community, and have harassed several anti-Zionist Palestinian, Muslim, and Jewish workers across the company. Google leadership has treated the company-sponsored Jewish Employee Resource Group, whose incentive as a company-sponsored group are aligned with maintaining the company's status quo as a singular voice of Jewish workers at Google. We need to ask ourselves, do we want to give the nationalist armies of the world our technology, or do we need to stand by the original theory behind Google that we can make money without doing evil? Where is the morality? I do not support Google's role in Project Nimbus.